Okay, welcome everybody to the town board meeting of Tuesday, May 8th, 2018. Start off with some announcements. This Saturday, the chapel, hey, there's the guru. Hey, Nick. Hey. <laughs> this Saturday, the farmer's market is back at the train station from 8.30 to 1 p.m. every Saturday. We have our 10K, 5K, pause walk, and kids fun run. On Sunday, May 20th, the 5K and the 10K and the pause walk is something we had last year. And uh, basically the pause walk is a uh, half, I assume the 5K and the 10K is self-explanatory. The pause walk is a half mile stroll uh, with your dog. Each dog receives a small gift, uh, compliments of uh, wags and whiskers. And this year, a new event, uh, well, we had it sort of last year, but this is a little more organized, a kids fun run. A unique kids fun run that would challenge your youngest runner's agility, balance, and endurance as they run through our obstacle course that includes two giant inflatables, perfect for kids ages 5 through 12. Join us for the Memorial Day Parade on Monday, May 28th, starting at 11 o'clock. On May 29th, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., thank a volunteer first responder day uh, that was started by a group of Girl Scouts, and they deliver cookies or drawings or a simple heartfelt thank you to our volunteer first responders. Art Around Town is May 31st from 5 to 8.30 p.m. That's in conjunction with the Northern Westchester Artist Guild. And um, basically the opening night is May 31st. And uh, there'll be musicians and, and painting event for empty bowls. And uh, 30 artists will have their artwork displayed in various merchants throughout town. The list will be coming out shortly. So that's the end of that. On to the supervisory report. We'll go over the streetscape update soon. We have Kaz here tonight. But this past Thursday, we paved Lower King and a portion of Greeley Avenue. Uh, last night, uh, we continued the installation of the new sanitary, sanitary system. We crossed South Greeley Avenue to the sidewalk on the east side of the street. And we continued now down the sidewalk for the rest of the week. Uh, please remember to paving check out. Paving is temporary. The paving is temporary. I got to add that. That's right. Uh, paving is temporary. So if anybody looks and was concerned about, many many people are thrilled with the paving. But if if you look at the paving and you thought it was we're done with the paving, we are not. That was temporary paving to smooth things out. We're still going to be digging up the road, but uh, it's it's a heck of a lot better, and we we removed a lot of the steel plates. So uh, tonight. We have an agenda uh, to adopt a local law to prohibit the sale of tobacco, liquid nicotine products, and electronic cigarettes to persons under the age of 21. And um, 120 sidewalks, uh, if you want some steel plates, <laughs> you can find them on 120. And if you missed Con Ed, you can find them there because they are now working on their gas main replacement project. This is phase two from Ridgewood Terrace to Elm Street. And then after they're done with their work, we'll start replacing the sidewalks, and we hope to be done by September. We received our second award for our 2017 comp plan. It was a commendation for outstanding planning achievement by the Westchester Municipal Planning Federation. Um, people have been asking when Lifetime Fitness is opening. They're saying the fall, October, I, I, I can't imagine, but that's what they're saying. They've had a very strong uh, response to their website. Over 1,400 people have signed up to get updates, which they say is the strongest response for a new suburban club anywhere. Uh, Police Week is coming up. That starts uh, the beginning of the week of Sunday, May 13th, and ends on Saturday, May 19th. And uh, May 15th is designated as Peace Officers Memorial Day. And uh, every day our officers here in Newcastle put their lives on the line to protect us. They deserve our thanks and support every week, but especially the week of Police Week. So please take a moment to thank them for their service. And uh, the people are asking about the Chapico Firehouse. Uh, apparently it's scheduled. Uh, they got their uh, permit on April 24th. And uh, if all goes well and weather permitting, the actual demolition of the building should commence on or about midweek next week. Actually, uh, this week, actually, May 16th. Uh, no, I'm sorry, next week, next week, May 16th, right. So. Uh, We'll see how that goes. And uh, people may have noticed they started digging the foundation for the uh, community sign um, across from the Shell Station. And uh, thank you to our Girl Scouts. I hope to have a picture um, at some point, or I could take a picture tomorrow, actually. But 
The Girl Scouts put fresh plants in the flower beds by the, in the Chapco Station in anticipation of the Memorial Day Parade. So thank you for them, and thank you to William Ravis for generously sponsoring the plantings. That's it for my supervisor report. On to Jill Shapiro for the Town Administrator's Report. Shapiro. Thank you. Um, today, Town Engineer Bob Scioli, Terry Rose, Steve Coleman, along with Con Ed Overhead, ELQ, and John Caswick from Boswell Engineering, uh, met this morning for over two hours to discuss and finalize the plans for the relocation of the 18 utility poles as part of our downtown infrastructure project. Uh, all permits have been secured, and we expect the project to be underway next week. We also reached out to New York State DOT and Con Ed Restoration about restoring the trench that runs a significant length of the King Street Hill, Center Street, and North Greeley. The um, trench is a result of their gas main replacement project over last winter, and the coal patch they used left a significant depression along the entire length of the trench. Uh, we'll keep the board posted. Um, insofar as their restoration efforts when Con Ed gets back to us, we, but we certainly expect that to be before the Memorial Day Parade. Um, and speaking of the Memorial Day Parade, it is scheduled this year for Monday, May 28th at 10.30 um, a.m. It starts at Victory Corners with the parade uh, participants assembling at 10.40 at the corner of Ridgewood Terrace uh, and stepping off at 11. Uh, parking permit season is about to begin. All permits expire on June 14th, and the online registration is now open for the 2018-2019 parking season. And uh, in response to a number of resident concerns, we were out uh, painting crosswalks today um, um, by the library. Uh, Lower King was done, um, up by Langs as well. Oh, and um, the striping on the... The parking spots on Lower King, John? We're going to try to do them tonight. Oh, well, They're fabulous. Yeah, we're trying to them up tonight. Okay. Um, yeah, and we're going to uh, be asking the state about um, some of the, uh, the larger crosswalk signs up mm -hmm. by Langs especially. Cool. Um, and I know the police chief is looking into those um, uh, solar, like, crosswalk signs, sort of flashing beacons mm -hmm. um, at some of the unattended crosswalks. So we'll see if we can move along with that as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so now we have Kaz here for an update on the uh, construction. Before you even begin, Kaz, we absolutely, unequivocally, one million percent need better signage so people know Detours. that you can't Detours. get an A to B no matter what time of night it is, no matter how long it's closed. You know, the other night I was out and I know that there's signs. I, didn't, I looked, I didn't see it, and I know that they're there or they should be there. I, I beg of you because, for lack of a better term, it rolls downhill to us when, uh, and to me. I'm not talking down King Street, <laughs> but it, it's actually a, a steeper pitch, and, yeah. and it hits pretty hard, and people are upset, but, I, I, you know, I haven't seen it too, so we need signs, we need yeah, the, notice, we need... The, the problem was that evening was because we were pulling out with the asphalt. We usually do not do that. We had it as our regular detour. But even in general, when I came yeah. down that night down King, which it was, was, we had it closed. There was nothing at the top that I saw, at least, on, off of 170. Yeah, it says that 120, you come off, it says 120, I think it's closed going up King Street. I'll check the signage, though. I'll go over that. I will go over that. It says local traffic only. Uh, road if I'm closed. having confusion, not that I should be the judge, yeah. but you know, the guy. It is. It's, no, I understand. Watch yourself, guys. <laughs> But, but I understand. If I know it's there, and I, you know, uh, and I, I'm expecting it, and I have an issue finding it or seeing it, someone who is not really up to date is not going to see it. It's yeah, it case. says it says road closed like 500 feet away, local traffic only. The thing is, I know that's the other issue we had early, you know, like six months ago, was that there you had the barricades up top, <laughs> and it was very clear that the road was closed. But then you had like Chapaca Tavern and Lake Jardine complained. That people can get to their restaurant. Yeah, so now, there's a happy medium. We gotta, we gotta right. figure it out. Yeah, see, now we have it. We don't have it closed. We just close it on South Greeley. So if you come down King Street, you can still go down King through into the parking lot and around and loop back up over the bridge, the 120 bridge. So it's really, it's closed only from Starbucks mm -hmm. to um, my office. You know, that's Whatever pretty much just debate it now. Just yeah, in average, out. but that's what we're trying to keep as much open. And then once now, once we get into the sidewalk, it should be opened. We should be able to maintain the traffic, even because at night there'll be no cars parked there, so we'll be able to work in the sidewalk and along where the people usually park 
and maintain traffic for everything. That's what we're trying to do. So the sewers are under the sidewalk? Yes. On that side of the street? Yep. And that'll start probably by the end of this week. I mean, you know, we did the leveling, the paving. Uh, the sanitary sewers are online on Lower King. We're now around the corner. We're starting the laterals by like all the scoops in that area. Um, yesterday and today we had Daniela. They're the sub for Verizon Underground to lower the lines up on North Greeley by the big uh, Verizon station that's there. That was a big problem we had because we have to bring <laughs> the, the storm sewers over that. So they're doing them. They will be here for the next couple of weeks doing, there's a couple other little spots for other drainage, but we have time. It's not really like a real big impact. Um, again, Monday, they're starting with the poles. And I just want everybody to know that they gotta be very careful when they come in with these, because we're putting in 55 foot poles. So they'll be coming on the back of trailers, on the back of trucks. So the thing's gonna be 90 feet long from the huh? front of the truck to the end of the pole, you know, when they come bringing these things in. So they're supposed to start Monday setting them. The day or the night? During the, the, we're trying to get them at night, but I, we talked today about it, and um, that a big pile driving noise. That no, they're going to hand dig most of them because there's so much underground utilities. You can't auger them, and they usually use the big auger. But you hit something. We have all the telephone lines are there, and it, there's just so much stuff on the ground out there. It's a lot of it where the poles are are on the corners where everything crosses, coming across. So some they'll be able to auger, most of them are all hand duck. So where six are foot they holes. storing them? Six foot? Well, six I don't know where they're, gonna, they're supposedly bringing them in, but they'll put them on trailers maybe up the north. I don't know where they're playing. They, that's a con. Yeah, I'll find out. That's a con. When they show up, I'll find out. This <laughs> is a con head sub kind of thing. So I don't know how many they're bringing at a time. I don't know if they're just going to bring two at a time as they put them up. Don't they have to take the. Well, I guess not. No, the old ones will come down if Afterward. we're done. And actually, when I met with them today, I brought to their attention there's a bunch of half poles on North Greeley that just have the Verizon lines on it. They have the new ones. So I went over that with uh, the guy from Verizon Overhead that, you know, we want those poles gone. So there's only single poles. There's about five of them on the end of North Greeley. Mm -hmm. And then I walked the rest of the job. There's like another one on uh, Washburn that's a half pole to try and get them out of there, you know, because I know you don't want the double poles as it is anyway. I know that you had that problem before. So, um, but that's pretty much it. They're planning on hoping to have the sanitary sewer done in the next three weeks to four weeks. Soon as they're done with that, we're going to start the drainage coming out of the culvert, and then they'll bring in the curb and sidewalk guy, because they didn't want to bring him till we're at that point, so that he doesn't do a certain amount of work and has to stop. So once they're there going, we can keep moving through. Now, when you do the sidewalks for the sewers on the east side of the street, I mean, we're going to have we're going to be able to keep the entrances to these buildings. Well, yeah, all open. that'll be maintained. One of the things that we talked about in our um, biweekly status meeting on the project uh, was preparing for the merchants on South Greeley, sort of a timeline for when they might expect the work to be in front of their store. Um, and I think that was something that ELQ said that they would look into, but could you possibly check back with them and see if that's feasible? Yeah, I, I, go, I go to the stores. I go in there and speak to them and say, we're going to be coming through tomorrow or in two days because... I really don't know how the work is going to progress once we start digging it and I see what's there mm -hmm. because you have planters that are built on top of the sidewalks, there's handicap ramps, and I don't know how any of that is built mm -hmm. where I'm digging 10 feet next to it, mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's down there. You start digging, things might start, you don't know what, because stuff is built out from a long time ago, and I don't know what's actually there. Once we start doing it, we know. I can say, okay, we're getting in two lengths a night or three lengths a night. We'll know mm -hmm. to give them. But at this point, have I, we it's given very hard. them the notice that we believe it's going to start on Monday and take course over the, yeah. over the next three yeah, weeks? Because I'll see them tomorrow. I'll see them okay. tomorrow because we're, we're coming into the manhole that starts it at that one connection. So once I get there and we start going down, I'll talk to them as we go. So well, you'll make sure tomorrow they'll, they'll be on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk to everybody. I. And if we're going to do work during the day on Monday, if, if they're going to come during the day, we should send out a notice. I mean, we don't want people to avoid downtown. You know, that's the problem. You don't want to discourage people from coming downtown. But at the same time, we're going to We're know. going to start with the poles on this end down here. So we have plenty of stuff to do from here to the Shell Station is probably a couple of days' worth of poles. I'm sorry. Can you just clarify what's the day work versus the night work? 
No, the day work would, might be Con Ed installing the new, new poles. New poles. And the but the the sewer work the sewer it's line still work be night. Night work. is night work. Yeah, but okay. the, the Con Ed may uh, they may be coming Monday. Right, right, but, yeah. but right. I would I would rather actually, since Con Ed is going to be starting at this end, I would rather them physically be here before I notify people that oh, absolutely. they're going to be yeah. here because, yeah. again, oh, we yeah. have no, no control no. over them oh, yeah, yeah. and, I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. want people to no, no, dismiss our notices because want to get they didn't into, show yeah. up again. Right. Well, and you don't want that could it be to affect our <laughs> merchants <laughs> either when if they don't show up. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I'm just saying so. be ready for the, uh, we should just have it in our radar too. To do it if they are here just to but again we don't want to discourage people to come downtown that's the problem as you know you try to provide notice but you also don't want to scare people away so that's the life we've chose <laughs> and i guess that's pretty much it we're moving okay. yeah the signage though like jeremy started and we're finished with it too it's really yeah. uh, it's been a problem um it's probably Some our biggest problem we have at this point yeah i mean i talked to elq after Thursday night and I said do we because we have to f there was no design for detour of paving there's nothing in the plans for it so we're trying to figure out the best way to do it because we're gonna have to rip and box out all those roads and it's not like something you dig it out and put the stone and pave it and everything in your you know in 10 hour shot you know you have to dig everything down for long lengths so we're working on it now to try to figure out how to maintain traffic during the day when we start doing that part of it. And that actually helps with part of the leveling so we can shift traffic to parking areas if we have to, because there's a lot of it that has to be dug out. And it's very hard. You can't, you can't put in eight inches of asphalt, one on top of the other in one night, because it's still too hot. You can put it on top of it again, then it all starts flexing and everything else when you go to roll it again. So there's that. But we're working on it. To figure it out. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Kaz. As have a good night. Thanks. Good night. You too. All right. So now we go to uh, public comment, new business. So we have two public hearings we're going to open, but if anybody's here for public comment, now would be the time. Okay. So then we'll go into our first public hearing, which is to um, a local law to amend Chapter 116 of the Code of the Town of Newcastle concerning the real property tax exemption for senior citizens. So I move to open that public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Nick, you want to give us a little summary or uh, Drew? Mm -hmm. You don't have to. Yep. Yep. Sure. So, <laughs> the real property tax law allows municipalities to adopt. Um, some extra provisions that we are able to add to the senior tax exemption, mostly allowing um, seniors to apply for the tax exemption if they miss a deadline or, um, you know, things like that. So it's an option. These are optional provisions that are set forth in the real property tax law that municipalities are allowed to adopt. And so right now we're considering whether or not the town is interested in adopting them at this time. And I think the most... Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought the most significant amendment that we were going to be making was to allow those who have received this exemption for five years in a row to no longer have to uh, uh, provide certain documentation, but to, be, to say by, via affidavit that they... Uh, right. that exactly. They That's how this... Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. Um, that's how this started, and then we were looking at the real property tax law, and we realized, well, wait, there's a there's a couple other provisions we can adopt as well, but that's that was the priority one, and that's how this conversation got started. You know, it's, it's interesting because we're, we're dealing with, right now, the veteran exemptions and the lack of proof of the veteran exemptions, and people are getting exemptions they should not be. And while we certainly want to make it more efficient and easy for senior citizens, we're lowering the burden to confirm their eligibility, but at the same time, one would think that once you become a senior citizen, you don't lose. You don't. Be, <laughs> I, I wish well, there was a time machine. It's, for, in it's, many a, ways, it's a senior all exemption, so it's right. an age plus income uh, uh, threshold. Income, right, so, okay. as opposed to burdening someone with uh, filing, a, you know, uh, the full tax returns, because some of these seniors at this point don't have to file the full tax returns. It, they could do a short form because they don't have enough income. Does it file? Does it file the property or to file as a person? Person. Okay, so that's different because the veteran tax exemption follows the property, correct? Is that was that, that was what our issue? No, there? It, it still actually follows the the person as long as the owner remains the owner or the spouse 
or actually the, the family. Family. Yeah. Um, but how are some family. properties? So when the property is transferred, when the property is sold, that exemption it is supposed to extinguish. Oh, okay. Understood. Right. Was it, it, it manually should have been done? It, it was, was not. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well. And just to highlight, the, the main um, provision that we, were, that we were trying to adopt is in uh, Section 2 of the Draft Local Law, 116, Section 6D. Mm -hmm. Just to point that out. No, thank you. So we any, keep this open? Yeah. Well, any public comments on this particular public oh, hearing? Do you want to talk about that? All right, so. You may want to talk about the fact that we, that we raised the income. Well, uh, just to point out one other thing that was brought to um, our attention today. In, in 116, Section 6A, we noticed that the income was set at 13500 that income corresponds with the original adoption of this local law in 1987. While the town updated the incomes, they never updated this provision. So we changed that just to correspond with what the current income level is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is which it, it, the 29,000 gives you the 50% tax exemption and then up to 37,399 gives you a sliding scale. Right, so the it's always set at the, and you'll look, if you go back and on to ECODES and you look at what it was in 19, I, I keep saying 1987, it might be 1986, um, but you'll see 13,500 13, corresponds with that um, max and, income and at that point. We here in Newcastle give the maximum senior citizen tax exemption that's allowable under New York state law. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to put a provision in the law so that each time that, um, Income level changes. We don't have to amend the law. Jill and I were just discussing that. Sorry. Jill and I were just discussing that. So we can. Yeah. I don't know if we're going to be able to come up with a language today because we want to see what the state provides. But we can. If you close the public hearing, we can before you vote on it. Um, see if there's language we can modify to address that. Because you're right. We don't want to keep adopting a local law every two years or three years. Right. Ah. Well, with these public hearings, we usually keep them open for written comments for a week yeah. anyway. Yeah, so. the, the, the issue oh, is we need is it for the we text. Need, uh, we need this to be on the books. So, that's, I mean, so, prior so by the time. The reason why we do is general this is not an exigency. Prior to when? June 1? Yeah. Move forward. So, so we're under a tight deadline in order to be able to extend this. Well, could, could we, though, pass it tonight, but subject to a language no. revision? Of course not. No, no, no okay. well, but That's maybe okay. between now and when you vote on it, I can come up with yeah, some language. So it's just, we, we, could always, we can always reopen Next it after June. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, so you can also <laughs> amend, hold another public hearing and amend yeah. it. Yeah. That's okay. So well, and I continue true. to think that the town of Newcastle, along with other towns in Westchester County, ought to explore whether it's possible for us to adopt the same local income thresholds that were adopted by New York City. So New York City was able to significantly increase the income eligibility threshold for the senior citizen um, tax exemption. And I think it's something that's worth pursuing here in Westchester County too, because we have a lot of the same sets of circumstances that New York City has when it comes to senior citizens and their income. Okay. So we're, we're you can close the public hearing, and I think to address your concern between now and when you vote on the next six okay. minutes, we'll be able to come up with some language. <laughs> Maybe. Oh. Don't you know. Let's see. Pressure's on. Yeah. <laughs> so are we closing the public hearing then? Yeah, we can, might as well. Okay, so I move to close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now the next public hearing is a continuation. Uh, we're getting a local law to amend Chapter 121 concerning tree pres preservation and uh, so motion to reopen this hearing yeah I move to Ooh. open it second all in favor aye aye I can second it I second it right number left no it Jeremy so moved I so moved I it. and I second it you were speaking but I jumped in front of you okay <laughs> <laughs> and then we all <laughs> we all agree <laughs> open open it wasn't a contentious issue <laughs> <laughs> fighting over whether she open it do you are, uh, okay, so now we have our first public comment for this public hearing. Yeah, so you might be the only <laughs> first and the last and the middle. Well, my name is Susan Meany, and I've lived in Newcastle. Uh, it'll be 37 years this August, and um, I'm here to comment on. Oh, I have a handout that um, actually Victoria Alzapedi had handed out at the last public hearing, um, and there's a few changes, and I have comments on it. 
Um, and today I had the pleasure of watching the, uh, the work session about the tree code that you had on May 1st, and it was very informative, and, and I was very pleased with how much detail you did discuss. And um, so some of the things that are in here um, are not exactly up to date with, with the thoughts, but I just wanted to hand out what. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Well, I said that blue is tough to differentiate. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> of red. It's not it's not it is. Bad. It's hard. Next page is worth it. Maybe it's the font. Okay, so the, um, the things that are highlighted in blue, which are a little difficult to read, uh, the first part is about the, we, we wanted to add some language to the legislative intent to bring in some current ecological concerns. Um, since the, the poppy, the, well, one of the big things is so many more storms and so many weather changes that are having a negative effect on the trees. And also, um, native pollinators are in decline for many reasons, including the use of pesticides. Um, so, uh, in the first uh, edition here, um, it, it highlights that uh, tree pr to protect one another from the impact of wind, um, and wind is, is a very important thing to trees. If you have a group of trees and you take down a few of them, it makes it more difficult for the other trees to stay up. So, um, you know, in, so that is something that, you know, we should, as part of an education process, let the town know that. Um, and uh, Steve has already done a job uh, that's going to be sent out with the uh, upcoming uh, water bills. Um, you know, with some guidelines on the tree permits, which is a great idea, mm -hmm. as well as um, a handout on the coyotes, um, which I think is terrific to send it out with the water bills. Everybody's going to open it, and they'll probably be happier to see that than the bill. <laughs> <laughs> it's the water quality report. Actually. Water quality report? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. And, okay, I know it is, yes. <laughs> um, and the other thing um, here is, we also wanted to add the language of providing a natural habitat and critically needed nesting sites for wild birds, pollinate, pollinators, and beneficial insects and other wildlife. Um, when the trees we had um, in our yard uh, were taken down or in our, on our neighbor's yard, um, it was done uh, late in the year or early this year, and there was actually a squirrel's nest in, in one of the trees, and it was very sad that the squirrels were displaced. But um, and, and the other part we wanted to add was something about um, native trees. Um, and there's some that are very, uh, they're, they're very slow growing and um, wanted to provide, and they provide unique ecological benefits. Um, and we wanted to somehow encourage the residents to retain and plant these trees whenever possible. Um, the next item, I uh, wanted to add the applicability to include all commercial and residential properties in the town. And the next um, item, the clearing, um, you discussed it in great detail in your meeting, um, and about what, how many trees in a quarter acre could be removed, um, and you know what you had said made sense to me, and um, and we understand from from what Steve had said in the meeting that um, trying to keep track of calendar years um, in terms of how many trees are taken down would be very difficult. But perhaps in, um, in some later, if the system becomes more available or the system has more capabilities, uh, maybe the building department would be able to track that um, so that there'd be, you know, people couldn't take down a bunch of trees in December and then take that down more in January. Mm -hmm. We don't, so. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Sorry, just sure. to interject here. Um, you continue to recommend the removal of six or more trees as opposed to the current version of the law says 10 or more trees. And I'm just curious, and you don't have to answer this in this moment, but if you, if you have any guidance as to why six as opposed to 10 and where that number came from. Um, I think it was from Victoria. Um, so she may have just, you know, have, she has more knowledge about this than I do, but she couldn't be here tonight. Yeah, so I'm just curious if that's an industry standard of any sort. In other words, was it from a best practice? Exactly, thank you. <laughs> you know, literature. Yes. As opposed to just some ar arbitrary, relatively speaking, number. Right, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Yeah. But, you know, I, 
now that I understand what a quarter acre area is, that was very informative. I thought you were talking about a quarter acre lot where you could take down, you know, 10 trees and then it's, it's, it could be on any size property. And if you want to clear an area of, uh, of, of more than 10 trees in a quarter acre, that would apply. So I thought that was, you know, it was actually an interesting video. <laughs> um, and in terms of the dead trees, uh, a recommendation was made to um, make sure that um, the, tree, the tree is considered dead when it's been determined by the environmental coordinator or a certified arborist uh, who submits something in writing on business letterhead. And um, in terms of the hazardous trees, uh, a tree that possesses a significant structural defect rather than just a structural defect. Um, just in walking around my neighborhood after I you know, got more involved in the, in the tree information, I found very few trees that didn't have defects. They have multiple um, mm -hmm. trunks. Uh, they've been, you know, they've lost limbs in storms. Um, some of them have, you know, like warts and things. I mean, they're not maybe so pretty, but, um, you know, just we wanted to make sure that somehow imperfect trees um, are not included in that. Otherwise, my neighborhood wouldn't have any <laughs> trees left. So. Um, and then there's the significant tree list. Um, there, there's a lot of trees that we just have hardly any of left, like the shag, or hickory, and the white oak. Um, and they, the white oak is a tree that provides more food to, um, to well, it provides a lot of um, uh, moths and caterpillars, which are kind of creepy things, but they're one of the main food sources for baby birds in the spring. Um, so at some point, I don't think it makes sense to hold up the tree code um, in the battle over creating a significant tree list, but perhaps it's something we could look into in the future, maybe the conservation board, um, to come up with things that are historically significant. Uh, the one thing that comes to mind with me is the tree right out in front of what used to be Reader's Digest, in front of the cupola. I mean, that, that tree I knew of when I was growing up in Peekskill. I mean, it was just like this famous tree. And you know, critic and the habitats, uh, at least the the trees with that are very environmentally needed. Um, we could even do a poll of the residents um, and you know, people who are, like on Facebook, that are interested in the nature of Westchester or those types of things, and ask if they have significant trees in their yard, things that are very unusual, um, historical value, or or these in, these native trees that are so hard to find you can't even buy at nurseries anymore, but they're wonderful for the wildlife. And um, here, the, I, I last time, um, I guess, when the contact information was here to uh, contact uh, someone to, before they cut down trees, they had Steve's uh, name, email address, and phone number. And we thought that might be a little excessive and maybe just uh, say that you could contact the Newcastle environmental coordinator and now it's the town number, just the main number if they want to speak to someone uh, rather than calling Steve directly and kind of overwhelming things. Okay. And now in the permit application process with the approval authority, um, just one thing here uh, that was possibility for inclusion is uh, for all applications for the removal of a tree, notice shall be given to by the applicant certified mail um, rather than three trees. Um, it's just in case that tree is enormous. Um, Jeremy even alluded to this um, in the video where you're talking about a beautiful tree in your neighborhood that someone cut down and you know it was just a loss that you can't really fix. Um, but three might be viable, but if, it, if it's some sort of a gigantic tree that's creating shade for multiple yards, in my area, I mean, we're only on uh, half acres, so one tree can span like four properties. Um, and it's just something to consider. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, and this um, here in the approval process, um, when, when the town environmental coordinator, Steve, goes out to look at properties, uh, we just made a suggestion here that perhaps um, he could visit the adjacent landowners, homeowners, um, you know, and just kind of look in their yard. Certainly he could call and ask permission and, and, and all of that, but it might give a different perspective for the impact on other properties where trees have been taken down or are going to be taken down um, just so he could see what, what it's going to be like once that happens. Um, OK, 
Okay. Um, and in here, I heard the discussion about um, notifying um, if someone goes before the Envi Environmental Review Board for a review or um, of what has happened, you know, what has been approved, um, and uh, they have 10 days after the decision has been made um, to, to approve a permit to uh, go before the Environmental Review Board for, um, you know, a, sec a second opinion, I don't know what to call it, but, um, and I understand um, it's really almost impossible to get people to, um, you know, send out a second low, you know, uh, list of email or list of uh, certified mails return receipt requested um, in time for that to happen. So um, I think it was, it might have been you in, in the video, um, where uh, you suggested that somewhere it be posted a number to call, uh, like at the <coughs> building department, if uh, so that they can check on the process that's going on, what so that they know when something is approved. Yeah. So we've addressed that concern. Yeah, just okay. in response to that, we're we're going to revise the notification form to um, include to clearly include that you can contact the environmental coordinator to access you know the information you're looking for, the application and whatnot. So that is clearly on the notification form. It's also going to set forth your rights and what the process is, so that anybody who is um, within a hundred feet of that property line where the tree removal is occurring will be aware of, of what's happening and who to contact for information. But we also state that it's their responsibility to stay on top of that as well, because there is that, you know, that 10 days. Mm -hmm. No, I greatly appreciate that. That's, that's a big help. Okay. And that's not in the law. That's going to be on the notification <coughs> form, which is Exhibit A of the application. Okay, that's So that will be available um, Thank you. from the town as well. Okay. Oh, and, and one of the, uh, the last items here um, at the very back under pruning, uh, as part of the uh, rollout of the revised tree preservation plan, the town of Newcastle should also local, uh, notify local tree companies of all the changes to the law and specify that they cannot prune over 25%. But I think it's broader than that. Um, we've talked about it at the conservation board meetings um, about having information like educational information available to mm -hmm. uh, landscapers and different you know the companies that come in and actually do the work um, obviously you can't force them to do things but you could you know educate them as to um, you know what the, what their requirements are if they it maybe make sure that they get a per they someone has a permit if they're going to take down a tree uh, but just in general uh, that's part of what might what's going to be happening in the conservation board this year and um the other only other request i have is um if obviously we do not want another public hearing about the trees but if we could get one week for public comment to be sent to the board if anyone is still interested today kind of turned out to be a strange day and people who were supposed to be here are not here and um you know some kind of um you know just throwing that out there if that's a possibility we usually leave it open for written comments. Okay. Any, the only reason we didn't do the one prior to this is because we it's had a relevant deadline. for the uh, tax uh, assessment. But mm -hmm. Okay, we'll that's Keep terrific. it open for written comments. Okay. So you didn't mention the replanting, and I'm actually curious about that. I'd circled that for myself. Okay. Drew, did we address this issue? I know Jeremy raised it in the work session last week, mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, as folks are taking down uh, tree trees and they receive approval mm -hmm. uh, for their permits right. um, but that those trees are in the sort of landscape buffer zone between their house and a neighbor's house and provide sc you know sc screening um, is there an ability for us in the legislation to require them to replant in that same area um, right I we just Jeremy talked did about did it in the discussion you, you were the one who, who raised we this. were never going to require it well, I, the question really in part was whether we could require it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's really been my understanding. There's a lot of issues. So, for example, um, I think you might actually have suggested this of, or maybe it wasn't, I apologize, it might have been Victoria. Um, you know, instead of it being three trees, if it's on within, you know, in 100 feet of a, land, of a border, if it's within five feet of a, a property line, it could be one, one tree depending on the size. And the issue was how do you enforce that because there's a property right issue. So how are you going to enforce somebody to plant in a particular manner on their pro own private property. And, and that's a real genuine question. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't disagree. And going back to that one example, three trees, one tree, when it's so close to the property line, but w w how do we enforce that over people's 
private property rights. Well, you have to approve the tree replacement plan as a part of approving their application. So the do we, within the tree replacement plan, have the ability to say, to review whether or not the, the proposed replacement is uh, within the same area, provide the same shading benefit? Well, my opinion is if, if the neighbor, if, you, if I want to take down a tree and you know, my property, I, I could take down a tree, and if, if my neighbor happened to have enjoyed the shading or the uh, screening, yeah. Yeah. then <coughs> I'm not willing to put the tree back in that location, then I would suggest the neighbor plant their own tree, provide yeah. shading. It's an interesting question, but, you know, it's well, my, it's well, my quite Frankly, a tree that's been there for 20 years is going to provide a different amount of shading than any tree you're going to plant. Absolutely. So yeah. it may be 20 years from now, it well, might be similar legal, shading. My, my but position is, my question is really more of a legal one. Right, it's a legal question as, as to what, what, what's, what's right, and, what's and, and my it's understanding legal. from the, the law is that, with, you know, the regulated landscape buffer is not a legal uh, designation. It's an arbitrary thing that homeowner, you know, that we put in the code to encourage homeowners to maintain a regulated land, you know, landscape buffer, and we have provisions for you know, the removal of trees within that zone. But we, I don't think we can require a homeowner to focus just on that area. And as I mentioned last week too, uh, my experience is the, how a person perceives what they do within that regulated landscape buffer is very different from homeowner to homeowner. Some prefer to have lawn right to their property line. And in many cases, that's what I experience is one homeowner is maintaining a visual screen for a neighbor that has lawn right to the property line. You know, so it becomes a fairness issue, and and how do you balance that? And so I don't, I don't think we can really regulate on a tree replacement plan to, you know, require that they only plant within a landscape buffer because they may have different interests. Right, look, someone may want a fence. If it's part of an approved landscaping plan, or if it's part of mm -hmm. your clearing and regrading limit lines, when we mm -hmm. Planning board puts it in there if it's right. part of a restrictive right. covenant, then you have that then ability have to, to do so. Right. Right. But if it's just someone has a tree on their property and then you're telling them they can't have it for the benefit of the neighbor, you, you don't have that legal right to regulate to that extent because no, of No, 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 not to tell them that they can't have it, but to say to them, you know, you're taking down a, tr a tree that's in this landscape buffer zone. We ask that you replant in this same buffer zone. As opposed I to don't think you can require that. But, but then you're requiring someone to do something that may not be part of how they intend to use their property when we don't have that legislative authority. Are we requiring landscape buffers on all properties within a residential zone of a five-foot setback? Or are we just saying, if you happen to have it now, you could never have lawn in that area. You need to have keep the buffer restored. Maybe someone's use of their property is that they, they don't want those trees because it's sap on the driveway or something of that nature, and they instead want lawned area. We're now getting to the area of um, encroaching upon their use of their property for the benefit of other property owners. In my experience too is that the majority of replanting does occur within the landscape buffer because people want to provide screening and you know visual buffer between their you know individual properties and so in, in I would say in the majority of cases that happens automatically. You know, it's rare that you get somebody that doesn't want to do that. And I think by adding the provision for the ability to uh, plant shrubs as one of the new, you know, re replacement criteria, it'll actually encourage even more uh, planting within that buffer zone. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Comment about that? Um, uh, we went through um, an environmental review board. Uh, because our neighbor was taking down 165 feet of mature hemlock trees, which formed a, a, a very thick border between our properties. And um, it ended up that uh, some of the trees were considered um, dead and hazardous trees and others were considered healthy trees. So they, um, it was the Environmental Review Board required them to replant um, to take the place of the trees that were, were still viable. Mm -hmm. um, and they requested and they requested that they plant them along our border and they said no, they're putting them on the other side. But um, we put up 30 8 to 10 foot tall um, green giant arborvitaes and um, it's going to take a while till they fill in but it's it just made a huge difference. We now look at houses way behind us and houses on 117 that we haven't seen in 37 years. Um, but it is, you know, it's their right to do that. 
um, you know, we, we may not have liked what they decided, but it is what it is. So we uh, we did our part and planted, and hopefully it did. It, uh, but it's, it sounds like a lot of it goes back to education, right? Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. people maybe knew the impact, they'd be less inclined or more inclined, if you way look at mm -hmm. it, to not take down those particular trees in question. But to, to Nick's point, too, if I have a sap-type tree on my property that's dripping all over my car, and you may like it because it gives you shade, I may not want that tree. Mm -hmm. So I should have that right to remove it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just grappling with the issue of being in the immediate vicinity of a property line, but I understand both sides, and I'm concerned about enforcement at the end of the day. Again, it may be an educational mm -hmm. position as opposed mm -hmm. to you can't because yeah. we don't have the authority to really stop that. Right. You want, yeah. you, want to be, you want to encourage people to be good neighbors, but you can't really, there's certain areas you can't legislate mm -hmm. be a good neighbor because no, I totally our property understand. rights involved. Yeah. Right, I mean, you know, if, to take it to its extreme, if a neighbor's wanted to, a, a mutual easement covering five feet either side of her properties and preserving that as a vegetated buffer would be a private party transaction, which they could do and enter into. And that keeps the town out of it and that it protects each of their property rights. But it's not something the town has that ability to regulate and require. I, mean, I, I kind of like the direction that Jeremy's recommending Education. here, you know, and, and I think that there's actually this process and all of the comments that we've received have really brought to light a number of sort of education issues um, that we as a town, you know, can can work on. Um, you know, I think there's there's things that we can legislate and then there's things that we can just improve our communications and outreach around. Um, and I think what we're trying to do right now is determine which is which in the, mm -hmm. these well, instances. I think it's, a, it's an educational issue for many of the, you know, the people who live in the town and also for the, the landscapers who are involved in, in doing things. And I mean, I, I, I th I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there's education, but you cannot make landscapers attend an educational session or no, I think it would be more like a read materials. Sort of and thing. again, I think, I mean, I get the buffer. I have that with all my neighbors, but frankly, if they took down a tree that I didn't like them taking down, I would plant a tree. I would never assume my neighbor is required to plant a tree where they don't want a tree. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's kind of certain types of education. I think are frankly, I think education has its place. I think some of it is frankly a waste of time because people do have a right to their property rights. So I think, you know, we can't go overboard with, I think, you know, education for the right reasons and for the right subject matter is obviously very appropriate. You wouldn't, you'd want people to learn about native trees. You want people to learn when a tree is actually dead versus not. But um, I think in terms of educating people on, on a buffer zone, I, people can see it. I don't know. I don't think you were, I don't think, I don't think, I mean, it kind of devolved. That's kind of what it devolved into and I okay. think it's, the, you know, there, there are points you can educate and points when it's kind of a waste of time, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Well, you also you don't want to, you know, educate, listen, I'm, I'm fine for education, but you could educate people with, with um, a goal in mind, right? I mean, we, somebody could argue, why don't we educate people on how to spot trees that might be sick or dangerous and should come down? I mean, a lot of people, like especially people who sign this letter, certainly wouldn't want to see that type of education. So the point is, education is great, but, you know, you also don't want to use it as a tool to, you know, get across a specific agenda when, you know, there might be other agendas that are I don't are think placed. we should presume that, that the people who signed on to this letter have a specific I agenda. I, I think he's talking just in general no, about I, education. I actually, I actually think that they would welcome that kind of education because when it comes to being able to identify a dead or hazardous tree, that's one of the issues that Sue's raising is that we need to be Let's sort of... this meandering stream no, back. No, yeah, yeah. no, but I'm not... I don't mean to say that they have an agenda. What I'm saying is that there are some people who may, may be more... Yes. More yes. concerned about. Let him finish talking. No, the, the point is there may be some people who want to see tons of trees come down for Con Edison wires and things like that. So everybody has different interests. I don't mean agenda is not a great word to use, but everybody has different interests. So if you're going to have an education campaign, then t theoretically you should cover the whole spectrum. Absolutely. Right? People that want don't want to see any trees ever taken down, and then some people who would like to see trees come down to, to minimize the electric, you know, power failures. And, and for safety. So there's, there's different interests involved. And, and all I'm saying is that when you have an education campaign, you should try to cover all the interests and not just one specific 
side of it. That's all. That's my point. I just wanted to make one more point: is that uh, I think the ordinance that the town of Newcastle has that uh, you know it's uh, known as one of the most comprehensive tree ordinances in you know Westchester County and in the region, and it's much more restrictive and and it provides the opportunity to address a lot of the bigger global issues when it comes to ecology and environmental management. And uh, you know, so I just want to put that out there that you guys should really applaud yourself because it is a really progressive and you know, far reaching ordinance. And I think we stretch the limits on property rights and uh, you, know, the, you know, what we do with it now. I want to thank you for taking notice. Thank you. I want to thank you for taking notice. I appreciate the comments. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Any other comments? You know what, I'd just be curious, when you, if anyone submits any letters, I'm just curious if they want to submit something about what they mean by significant for the purpose of no. hazardous tree. It seems like it's okay, but it's vague. Yeah, what, I don't know what that means. So if anyone has any suggestion when they send something in, what, what, significant means nothing unless it's, it's identified and defined. So I'm just curious thoughts on that. Um, well, just one clarification on that the, the definition we have in our code is from the International Society of Arborists, which is an international organization, and that you know is really a standard definition that's been you know tried and tested probably for 60, 70 years already. So, so there's nothing if you added the word significant. Significant really doesn't mean anything when you're analyzing structural defects and trees. There's different you know, parameters that you're trained to, you know, look at. Yeah, you know, but significant really is not a term that is used in the, you know, the evaluation. So, Steve, so does structural defect in arborist yes. language structural mean something. mean something more than what I think? A yes. It's yeah. not an so abnormality. It has a specific meaning. Structural defect is kind of creates the red flag you know, for when you're assessing trees. So, right. then that, so maybe we should say, yes, yeah, structural defect as defined in the code I mean, of... we could reference the ISA standard yeah. if you want, you know, in, in the code. Yeah, I think I but, would do that. Uh, my only concern so, is that so, the, I don't know that you want to modify structural defect because the concern in the definition of hazardous tree is that its location or position poses a foreseeable danger to persons or property. So the structural defect, I read it. right? Well, including but not limited to. Yeah. Well, I'm it says not so or sure. one whose bit. location. Yeah. I'm yeah. not. You know, part of it is the definition is written very carefully because of Doesn't the way that you assess trees, because it does deal with, you know, it's all about the target and you know, and you know, an arborist term in terms of you know what is the target that that tree if it fell or failed, you know, what is it, what impact is that going to have? You know, and so the location and then the foreseeable danger, I mean, there's all different parameters that you evaluate when you assess the tree's condition. Mm -hmm. so, but I really so like I would Lisa's be inclined to leave the definition as is because I think it's a standard definition that majority of uh, ordinances well, Maybe have. we should say as, right, you know that, <laughs> but if I was going to look at it to, you know, to your point, to her point as well, you look at any tree, it might look like it is a structural defect to me. So if I'm reading this and I've never read the International Arborist, whatever it is, I'm going to look at I haven't. I, I, it's on my list. So um, if I'm going to look at it and I say, okay, a tree that possesses a structural defect, oh, yeah, that tree does, I'm not going to be able to interpret it the mm -hmm. way right. you may interpret it. So I could go take that tree down, and it might not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. right. So maybe we want to say, as defined in, you know, whatever the appropriate. Yeah, I guess there's two options. We could say, as defined in, and reference the, what's it, what's it, the IA, IA, ISA. ISA. Yeah. Or, um, or we could take a look and maybe add structural defect as a definition and right. take it, copy it ex word for word from the ISA and put it in here. Yeah, but I have one. to see. I don't know how long it is. I, you know, I don't know if well, it's a little past. That's paragraph. probably easier. I mean, no one that people may not go to find right. the ISA. They may not, so exactly. it's, it's more complete. Yeah, we but we should take wonder in, in the definition for dead tree, 
Oh, oh, this is your recommendation to add as determined by the environmental coordinator or yeah, certified that arborist. Would, that doesn't exist in, in our that, version That's today. not something I right. would recommend. Okay, right, because, okay, all right. So I'll, I'll, look, I'll look into that. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, there are more comments. Steve, you don't poke it to see if it's dead, see if it reacts. <laughs> Hi, Cynthia Manacharine, 100 Glendale Road. Um, I thank you for continuing to take the deep dive. I'm wondering if you could explain what you expect to happen between now and your final resolution to update the code that we have in Newcastle and how long that will take from, from now. So the continuation of this process. Well, we're gonna, we would leave the public hearing open for a week. Another week for written comments. And then we would uh, put it on an agenda for consideration of a vote. Yeah, we typically will then circulate a draft, uh, you know, and then. Uh, well, and we discuss we get, the comments today right, and get, whatever other ones come in. If we get, right, if we get additional comments, we discuss it, we come to a final draft, and then we put their vote. So, um, would it be possible because, for instance, between the public meetings and then your own meetings where you actually work on changing language, um, comments that would come in after today, but before people read your final proposed draft might not be um, pertinent to the final draft, or there might be opinions about that final draft. You know, I found your changes to be meaningful from last time to this time but they were only posted after last week's meeting, which was not a public meeting. So it's just hard to keep up and stay on top of um, the way the discussions are going and offer meaningful comments when, you know, we all also have day jobs and so forth. And so I feel like giving the community one more week might not be enough time, especially since you're going to take this information and also update your I drafts. Don't care, I mean, say to Callis wife, well, to keep it open another week for more comment, I mean, in terms of written submissions and... Mm -hmm. There's no rush to get it done, but yeah, the fact is, yeah, is that, just to clarify what you said, all the meetings yeah. have been yeah, they're all open. Public. They're all public. And the oh, really? Draft, yeah. Of course. I mean, every meeting... And this is they're not like all... For comments? Yeah. Your... Work sessions. Work, public work sessions. Meetings. People can actually comment yeah. as well. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Okay, um, then I was wondering, based on my comments from last time, if you had thoughts about looking at all of Newcastle and seeing the very diverse landscapes and, and zoning, and um, have you thought that it might be a good idea to apply different kinds of regulations to different kinds of uh, landscapes? I, I, we did bring this up, I believe, last last week, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and I think there's some validity to it. Um, I, I don't know if we all agree or disagree, but there is some validity to it. A 20-acre parcel is a lot different than a quarter-acre parcel. Um, In terms of its environmental uh, yeah, significance. Of course, of course. Of course. I, I, I personally think that if somebody has 20 acres, the threshold to take down trees would be higher. Like, I personally think if if somebody, you know, has 20 acres, they should be allowed. I would actually rate, I think you actually advocating for a lower standard, but m in my opinion, if somebody has 20 acres, that person should be able to take down more trees with that oversight than somebody who has a quarter of an acre. So that actually goes exactly against what you're saying, but that's, that's, if I was to do that by zoning, that's how I would approach it, that somebody with 20 acres should not have to come to get a, a permit to take down four trees like somebody who has a quarter acre does. Well, actually, what I, I was uh, talking about when I came last time has to do more with what's counted as a, import, a viable tree and what's not. So in the forest, because you want all age of trees to create the sustainability, the sapling all the way to the uh, tree that's dying or dead, um, I thought the count should be different, the way in which you take into account what's being cut. Um, is what I thought should be looked at. Remind us your opinion if, uh, on that issue. I'm sorry if you need to, to have it restated. And can I just add to that? Didn't we talk last week about 
if I'm not going to have the verbiage correct, but if you are part of a yeah. forest yeah. So section, protection yeah, program section, or something like that, that right. rules would be, would that there would be some forest provisions that you had section to comply 121-4 with? Section 121.4C deals with forest it's management it's activities. And if the property has a forest management plan. No, no, it wasn't. It, it was wasn't a discussion the forest of management acres was 50 acres, but then there was like a forest something that was a lower threshold of acres. 15 acres, acres yeah. right. 15 acres. But then wasn't there something there was smaller seven that acre, was like seven there acres, was a 15 I think? acre. I was mm -hmm. watching your discussion. So we were incorporating that type of language. And, and what will it actually mean? Because I was, I was trying to understand the difference between the different size parcels, but what are the implications? What are you trying to achieve? Well, in that way. similar to what you said, that that the rules for that the DECs put out for forests may be a little yes, maybe a little different, and that if you were following those guidelines, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. If you were following those DEC guidelines, that the, that that would be appropriate. So the new code will ask the public to follow them, or you have a choice. How how. Go ahead. What's in the, what's in the current code that uh, I referenced is the New York State for, you know, DEC has a program where you can apply through its 480, section 480 of the, their code. 480-A. Dash right. Dash okay. And there's 482, but 480-A, and it, it allows a homeowner that they have to have a certain acre threshold to qualify. Yeah, but it gives them tax exemptions for managing their forest, pro their property as a forest through DEC. You know, and so there's very specific parameters and criteria, you know, that they have to follow. And they have know, to register and take courses and things and they, like that. Yeah, and they, they work with a New York State DEC forester that will come out to the property and evaluate and assess. And their approach is often designed for economic benefit as well. I mean, they look at it from a, you know, a sustainable practice of timber harvesting and, you know, managing the forest as a woodlot. You know, it's not just ecologically driven. You know, so it's a way for a homeowner to, you know, if they have the acreage to, you know, receive some economic benefit as well as, you know, some of the other exemptions and things that the you know the program provides within the code we also have that a reference to other programs that DEC has where if an individual wanted to do those they could apply talk to the town and I'm sure we would work with them you know if it met the criteria of DEC I don't see why we wouldn't work with a homeowner that wants to take an interest in managing you know their, their property you know under those programs you know, for example, for example, Campfire Club is uh, one of them that has the 480A, you know, exemption, and they've been doing that for probably, I'd want to say probably 60, 70 years on that. That's one of the only ones that I'm aware of in, in town on that. The other, the other question for you, Jeremy, is, uh, you know, the tree ordinance is set up so that it applies throughout the entire town, you know, based on our zoning districts. You know, and the criteria is set up so that there's different, you know, standards for a quarter acre up through the two acre zone. You know, with large lots, we address it through the same process. You know, the, you know, the difference is with the large lots, we don't necessarily address some of the bigger, broader goals, but that's usually what taking place with other codes. You know, we have a subdivision regulation, we have steep slopes, we have, you know, other things that may come into play to evaluate some of those impacts. But, uh, you know, the tree ordinance was really set up to make it be zoning based so that, you know, there was an equitable, you know, process so that it was treated the same in a quarter acre through a two acre zone. You know, obviously, you know, if they're taking 10 trees in a, you know, in a two acre zone has a different type of impact than in a quarter acre zone. But that's why we added the tree replacement and other things within the you know, code to try to address, you know, some of that, you know, scale of impact that may occur. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
So do I understand that if I don't want to apply to the DEC and I just want to use the town uh, tree ordinance, then what is my responsibility if I have a large lot in terms of applying, <coughs> not, not different from somebody who's on a quarter acre lot? I follow the same expectations of the town. And what I'm suggesting is there are certain parts of the town that, for instance, I uh, gave you a handout that are part of the a special biodiversity corridor that connects to many other um, municipalities within Newcastle. And, and wouldn't it be responsible to work those areas of the town differently and work in tandem with this corridor and other municipalities of of Westchester to um, to try to create a sustainable environment um, that is benefits everyone. To, is the way to start that process through this legislation or is the way to start that process by getting together with those other towns and, I love that and idea. trying to, the to sort of, you know, Oh, uh, Capulets, you know, I'm, I'm just George Latimer, any of them. Yeah, that I'm would just all trying be to think about how's the best way to sort of um, create kind of a classification for the greater T Town area and a sort of separate set of you know guidelines and and you know, but it's probably not limited to tree tree le preservation le legislation. Sure. It's probably much broader than that. I don't know if you guys have given any thought to trying to sort of form a. Well, the question is, you know, would Newcastle not, be, not would Newcastle right words, be interested in pursuing that is, is part of the question. Well, you would, you would, would, we don't control the land. I mean, if, if you have 20 acres, you're certainly free to follow the DEC recommendations. But let's say another property owner, you know, doesn't want to follow it. Why, sh why should we force them to follow voluntary recommendations? I mean, why should, you're free to do it if you like. But like Sunshine Home, for example, why should we force them to follow regulations that are voluntary? Is that, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's an entire d different topic, I Right, think, but you're free, to Sunshine. You're, free, you're free to follow and the DC regulations if you want. They're in a residential zone trying to put together commercial projects, so I, that's I a understand, but I'm saying, project. but you're, you're free to follow the regulations if you want. Why should we force it on voluntary regulation, voluntary things on people? I mean, you're doing that in essence with any code. You're setting up regulations um, for a civilized community to follow based on, you know, essentially the comp plan that the town has approved. DC's not even forcing the people to do it. They're doing it in exchange for tax exemptions. So they're not even forcing it. Why should we as a town force it on people? Um, I don't see it as a force. I see, you know, people, for instance, in the West End as choosing that lifestyle and then having things happen to their zoning and to their neighborhood that completely change the enjoyment and the uh, visual impact of the community that they've chosen to live in. Yeah, I, and I mean, community that they care about, too. They pick the woods, they care about sustainability, all that kind of stuff. I guess I can follow that. They should be encouraged to follow those regu regulations that are mandated, that are optional. I guess what I'm didn't mandate them. suggesting is, is exactly this, that we're not legislating through our law the way it ought to work for all of Greater T-Town, but rather I'm wondering if there's a way for you all to form a coalition and to come to us and to come to the other towns in that corridor and say, you know, this is what we recommend and would you all sign on to this as the series of sort of guidelines and, and relevant policy and legislation for that area. Which, which means that you would yeah. you would at this time, uh, you know, continue on with finishing up the code that you're pursuing right now, but you would be open-minded to reviewing it in the near future. I can't again? speak for everybody, but that's what I'm that's saying. That's a lot of you know, like, to help address. I mean, we have done a lot of broader you know studies in the past. I mean, there was an initiative on the west end that included the T Town area. It was a uh, you know, the Metropolitan Conservation Alliance it was a, yeah. an organization that was part of the Bronx Zoo. Uh, you know, we worked on creating a five uh, town study, you know, looking at biodiversity corridors and we identified, you know, in, you know, Newcastle, also in Yorktown, Cortland, you know, and surrounding communities. And we came up with a lot of, 
you know, different standards and performance criteria that could be applied, you know, within that area. You know, some of the action items within that document were to look at creating potential legislation to identify, you know, key biodiversity corridors, wildlife corridors, or important elements that, you know, had unique environmental characteristics. That, you know, never happened. I mean, there's been initiatives in some of the other towns, but it, there's no current legislation in any of the surrounding communities to implement that because of the difficulties. Wildlife don't respect boundaries. You know, and so there's a lot of issues in terms of how you come up with effective legislation, you know, that can have an enforcement tool, you know, with it. I mean, there's good planning information and good, you know, information that's provided in terms of assessment. And, you know, we've tried to look at doing overlays. We did that when we, you know, completed our open space plan back in 2007 and 8. We recommended as a means to protect the east and west ends of town, we did the environmental overlay district, you know, and that was a legislation that we did specifically geared to protecting wetlands at a greater level and really looking at water quality. You know, so that that's an offshoot of doing some of these broader studies, but I don't feel that tree ordinance is broad enough in scope to really address those type of issues. I think it's more important that it's a, you know, kind of a routine ordinance that, you know, is pretty fairly consistently applied through the zoning districts. You know, but some of these broader issues, I think, are better addressed by doing some studies and then looking at whether it makes sense to propose legislation or other strategies, whether you do, you know, performance standards. I mean, we did that with our proposed trail, you know, trail management plan that we did for the east and west ends. You know, we asked the town board at the time to adopt it as a policy, which they did, and that's helped guide the planning board when any of those projects come forward. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been able to get conservation easements or pedestrian easements for walkways and other things through that. So, I mean, those are some of the tangible ways that I think we have done it, and I think it would be the same, you know, process that could be applied to the West End. I, I, and, but I, I don't think it's really the tree ordinance is really not the appropriate. I, I do believe it's a bigger mechanism to get there, but I do also think that you do need to protect these. Well, everything, but in generally speaking, but these biodiversity corridors that you just you provided for us, and, and I'm assuming that it's accurate. I'm no reason to, to doubt that you that, that it isn't. Yeah, the, right. that's not so, my data. Right, right. I, so I I think while it's certainly important off of 117 as it is you know, west towards the west end, but if there's a biodiversity area, it probably, the, the, the means by which to, to protect it is a lot broader than a tree ordinance. So that doesn't mean we can't be those, you know, the, the initiator of legislation to make that happen and then other mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. and other municipalities could follow. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily in this legislation for what you're really looking for because it's a much bigger it's so much bigger right, than trees. But it's it's a, so much bigger uh, than trees. I understand, but it's all these pieces to the puzzle, and the next, you know, you turn around and you try to protect yeah. each piece that's falling down, and you run into, well, town code says, right. and end of story. You don't have any grounds I'm, to stand Bottom line is I'm open, very much open to what you're suggesting. Uh, I don't think it should hold up this legislation, right. in my view. Um, but I think it's something that we should move forward mm -hmm. in a fairly reasonably quick manner because I, I, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. Once it's damaged, it's damaged. Right. So. Well, and I'd like to give you the example. You know, um, there was discussion about Con Ed and the way they really surprised everybody. I don't know. I tried to look up the actual description or, or terminology for storm hardening in relation to trees, because storm hardening includes a whole lot of different activities. I really couldn't find that, and I think that w w Newcastle could come up with that in your definitions list, like what does that include? Because they did clear cut, and the notion that they got approvals from most of the property owners to do that, the truth of the matter is there's a huge swath of Glendale Road across the street from me that is owned by the village of Austining. Mm -hmm. It is their um, watershed that runs into Indian Brook right there on Glendale to the back of my property and into Indian Brook Reservoir. And the clear cutting of the trees over that area 
took Village of Austin by surprise, but Con Ed looked at all of that land as um, town land, you know, no notice needed. And what's happening is you've got the tree canopy over their aquifer gone, right? So the dehydration in, in a bad summer, and we're all expecting these up and down uh, weather experience moving forward, um, is really impactful. And there, there could have been much more careful discussion about the environmental impacts on something like that. Steve, didn't, didn't they get consent from, for each and every tree from the municipalities when they took down those trees? T typically they do. I mean, in this case, we were not notified you know, immediately. It came later. After they took down the trees? After they started, you know, we, once we started getting phone calls, then we went out and, you know, talked to them, and they agreed to stop, and, you know, and that's when they explained that it was a storm hardening project that they were doing. But, but they, they never even consent. gave you the full scope of what was going to take well, place. So we, we did scope, add to this legislation based on your comments at the, the, the last public hearing. We mm -hmm. added in here that public entities, agencies, and electrical utilities shall provide notification to the town arborist and property owner of property where tree removal will be conducted prior to the removal of any trees, tree or trees. The problem um, is we can't and, find but, them or anything if they... Uh, but, you know, one, one issue that this raises for me, though, is that just because Con Ed is notifying the town, what is the town's responsibility then to turn around and notify the public? Um, because that's not public notification, it's just notification to the town. Well, and isn't it easier to just go and clear cut if you're going to get into it than to work with Steve tree by tree and make, you know, very specific decisions about what stays and what goes? They just looked at that area and decided, oh, no, <laughs> you know, this is going to take too much time. We've got a job to do, right? So yeah. I think there should be an expectation that there is a, a, a collaboration between your environmental consultant and these utilities when they have projects that they're deciding to do. And I assume that that's a collaboration that you both would welcome. Who's we? <laughs> Who are you looking at? Me? <laughs> I, you know, I think one of the things we have to remember is that, you know, the utility companies are governed by a whole different set of regulations. Of and the towns and the municipalities don't necessarily have a lot of oversight on those regulations. You know, you have to work through the Public Service Commission and other entities to try to affect change. But a, you know, I think, you know, from, for routine line clearing and other management that Con Ed does, they're very, you know, they have a very set process where they do send out notifications to all adjoining, you know, property owners if there's a tree that they want to take down, you know, that's within their easement area. The homeowner has to give them permission or, the, or they won't take it down. And then if a tree is in the right of way for the town, you know, they have a right to take it down by right, but they, as a practice, will usually ask us for our, you know, concurrent review of those trees, and then if we agree with their assessment, we allow them to be removed. They don't need our permission, but, you know, they do it because they feel it's good public relations and cooperation. And the also, if they don't have any thing. responsibility to replanting, you know, if that's not in their budget and not their responsibility, yeah in public right of way i mean but as couldn't a general the policy they're not going to encourage planting within the right of way because that creates additional cost and problems in the future well they have lists of trees that they consider to be appropriate online and i think you've linked to it you know if you have these conditions we recommend you plant a tree that only grows this tall or this wide but, or but the all those things the town of newcastle's policy has always been that we do not allow trees to be planted within the right of way either because of the utility functions and you know future road improvements and drainage and which know, is we why typically do not allow trees or stone walls or anything else to be put in the right of way you know just to protect that for future uses which is why i'm suggesting the west end is kind of a different set of issues you know you cut down the the canopy over the Indian Brook watershed, yeah. it's a different set of issues mm -hmm. that deserve a little bit of um, more specific focus and intention. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, 
And then um, the issue of notice. Uh, I'm not that organized this week, but I think I saw that you're suggesting that um, for any removal of trees that meets a standard for notice, um, it should uh, the neighbors within 100 feet of the boundary of the property, um, is it 100 feet, need to be notified? 100 feet, yes. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest, for instance, with large parcels, um, 100 feet is not enough. And that is one of the reasons I think the West End got so upset with the whole sunshine piece. 100 feet barely gets you the, just the guy next door, let alone the community, that took a very well, long time to catch up. From the outside of the parcel, not from the tree. Oh, yes, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, from the perimeter, the boundaries of the of the So any property. parcels that are next to it, even if the house is miles away, would still fall into that? Yeah, but it's a, yeah, but 100 feet from the perimeter of the homeowner's property mm -hmm. on all sides. Right, so as, opposed, as opposed to the I get little it. small, what, what you're saying, as opposed to the little small bang, 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 when you have 100 feet. Nobody one gets to property. know. It's right. one neighbor as opposed to neighbor. Right, and, and so I think that really took a lot of people by surprise, and maybe in those kinds of moments, the tree ordinance should include a different kind of notification, maybe the scope of a project or this, the number of trees, something with a little more information. You know, the first notice that we got as boundary neighbors was a one-page certified letter, Xerox, that just said your neighbor uh, has a first public meeting on this date if you would like to come for, for a tree uh, removal um, uh, permit. You know, it didn't strike me to did it, did tell anything. How many trees and, or anything like that? Um, I can send it to you. Steve, possibly. Did you say how many trees? What is this part we, of the sunshine possibly, application? Is that what yeah, you're talking about? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I that was, I think, a larger meeting. part of zoning and. No, but the very first notification. Secret was, was a that was a, pub, a big public meeting. Yeah, yeah. Just to just to um, clarify, so we're we are amending the notification form, and it will clearly set forth how many trees and all that. And I think it was dis distributed to the board. Um, last last week, so it does clarify and add additional information so that property owners are are clearly know what's going on in neighboring properties. And, and is it only going to be neighboring where it's, you know? I mean, the current notification that's used for planning board for zoning board applications, wetlands, it, it all follows the guidelines of it's usually either 100 feet or if it's in the overlay district, it's 150 feet of adjacent and abutting property owners. That's in all of our code, so, you know. And I, all those notices are pretty vague. I know I get them yeah, yeah. anytime something's going on at Chappaqua Crossing, and it always just says the planning board's having a meeting about an issue. Yeah, that's that's, that's about all it says. Yeah, our, our, our tree notice, I think, right. has been uh, beefed up a little bit. Yeah. So it's has a lot more to offer. But you know, most of that is done through the State Environmental Quality Review Act and Seeker, you know, and, the, and it's the standard forms and the information that's provided, you know, and, and it's designed to be, you know, a public document that the homeowner or interested party can take, and then if they're interested, it's their responsibility to follow up on, on that. Okay. I'm not sure, this is inf interesting information, but for me it's the 100 foot from the boundary of the property owner, and I'm wondering, depending on the scope of the work or the uh, scale of the properties of the particular part of Newcastle, whether there can be more notification that gets sent out, not just perimeter owners, because 100 feet gets you what, what just about, your neighbor. What about language, if, if the goal and the objective is to notify for example, five, six, seven, ten, twelve neighbors in a small district. What about a hundred feet, but no less than the immediate adjacent two neighbors? You know, uh, we, we can come with language with that. I understood the goal was to protect a certain area where it would be impacted by the tree being removed. So whether that's divided by ten properties or one property, the goal isn't looking at it from the number of properties, but looking at it from a linear distance to protect that area. That was my understanding of the linear distance. You could certainly, right. and that's, a, that's from a visual. That's from a visual standpoint. 
the screening issue, right? Well, it seems to be more. That, more th that's yeah. what's, and I'm saying, I, you know, in the case of this particular project, there's so much more at stake than just screening. There's the screening is. Well, forget sunshine for a minute because I think that's a separate issue that's before zoning and right. everyone else. But let's talk about your neighbors, right? And not a not a proposed commercial development right now, but. If your neighbor who is on 15 acres is taking down a few trees, it really is, I mean, I, maybe you disagree, but do you think they have to notify more than 100 feet? feet? Um, I, again, if as they're you taking said, down you a few get... trees, forget a large commercial development. We, that has its other issues. But uh, let's talk about generally the tree code. If your neighbor or you need to take down a few trees, do you, how many people do you think you need to notify? I want to be a good neighbor, and I think, um, you know, my part of town doesn't only have one commercial property, but several right now that are in process, and it's always about the trees or the water mm -hmm. or the septic. So I'm just here to try to say... Right. The concerns are different, and the views are different, and the goals are different, and I'm not sure it really gets um, looked at. Yeah, no, no, I agree. So but if um, Nick or Drew, for one of these developments, like a sunshine, I mean, they're not just abiding by the tree code. There are other oh, significant. It's, I was say it's part of a site so plan review. So they're the not going to just do. have to notify a hundred feet, right? There, it's a much broader. No. It's no, a, so I'm, no. I'm asking the lawyers. There's Nick. Right. So, like, if they're, do they have to only abide by the tree code, or is there a much broader, do they need to notify people more than 100 feet well, away? Two questions. They'd have to abide by more than just the tree code. They'd have to abide by the site plan review. And then the, when you have a public hearing as a site plan, there is a linear distance requirement. And I think Steve is telling me that that's 100 feet, which mm -hmm. actually I think that's where you need to look at because 100 feet. Right is actually small. I've seen 250, I've seen 500. 100 is on the, on the lower end. Right. So, so that's something like there. that, that's to me, area. something like that is differentiated uh, potentially no. than mm -hmm. yeah. well, to, to answer friendly your neighbors question, when it's not a commercial development. Right. right. To answer your question, there were a large number of different kinds of meetings and topics. Right. Each time there was a notification required, the notification only needed to go to the abutting neighbors, mm -hmm. period. So, well, maybe that's something we should look at for each type. Yeah, and as Steve said, there's consistency throughout the planning board, the zoning board, and so forth for notification, mm -hmm. tree plan, a uh, tree preservation uh, requirements. There is this consistency of, for the West End, kind of lack of information because 100 feet doesn't get you very far. So maybe that issue is broader than the tree code, and really we need to look at yeah, notification so we'll for significant uh, projects. Yeah, so we'll look at that. Yeah, public hearing great. notice requirements. I mean, Steve, how many, how many trees are yeah. taken down for a Chapel crossing? About a, almost a thousand? They're going to be? I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, it, it, for some reason I seem to remember it was 800 and some yeah, trees like that were taken down. Like that. And, and that's only yeah, four inch caliber or above? Yeah, well, it was either four yeah. inch or eight inch, Counted. depending yeah. on where. And that's in a small yeah. area. You want to talk yeah. about visibility, you know, now people no, are looking at No, of course. The yeah, but one of the things you have to keep in mind, too, is they have a very extensive tree replacement. I mean, they're putting back three to one. Mm -hmm. You know, it may not look like much now. I mean, they're putting the, t the trees in. They're starting now. I saw. And, uh, you know, the really nice quality trees that are going in, and 15 years from now, you know, it's going to be a forest again. Right. You know, and you're going to have a really nice buffer along Rowing Brook Road and other places where if we didn't have those provisions in the code, we wouldn't be allowed or wouldn't be able to require 15. the application. But that wasn't right. even in the code. That was part of the site plan approval, and I remember having a lot of discussions about yeah. that, about yeah. making it a very thick buffer. Yeah, but, but, that, but the tree ordinance is what gave it the strength because they had to replace 50% right. right. of the diameter. Mm -hmm. Plus they had to put a couple yeah. hundred thousand dollars in the uh, tree fund. And then on top of that, even, even maxing out what they could plant on site, they also did the tree bank donation for the excess. I already mentioned that because, well, I, but, you know, it's not like the West End gets, you know, sort of screwed, for lack of a better word, with, with taking down trees. I mean, it's, it was 
Sure. Yeah. I don't know enough about the Chapel Crossing project, except that I know it's on every agenda all the time, um, still. But um, that's another point that I wanted to bring up in the tree replacement. So in our area, there's steep slopes. It's kind of hard to identify all the time uh, a, a good location to plant a new tree. We also have water and well issues to be able to. So I understand if you max out on the site plan and you can't find another place to put the tree back. But I would also ask, well, so if we are in this biodiversity corridor, then can the tree bank have categories where the dollars that go into that bank will be utilized in that corridor in Newcastle to replant, you know, uh, under for proper forest sustainable management policy, instead of having that bank be, you know, that account be used anywhere. That seems mm -hmm. fair. Mm -hmm. You know, to try to put right. it back where it came from somewhere. Absolutely. So, I'm going to leave you guys. I think we're all tired. But thank you very much, and thank you for continuing yeah, thank to pursue you. this. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Just to clarify, that language is within the revisions you know, that are before you for the, you know, tree bank. Uh, it does outline, you know, that plans will be put together, you know, for projects to try to replace where we can. I mean, the restrictions we obviously have are, you know, we restrict it to public property or private property that gives an easement, you know, to the town on that for implementation. So are we going to hold this open now for public com for written comments? Yeah, so we can hold it open. Oops, sorry. Let's hold it open. I, I think the, the point's a good point. We should hold it open for at least two weeks. And then after one week, we can have an updated draft so that people then could have another week to review the updated draft. Okay, so that actually uh, works. So um, our next meeting is the 15th. We are not meeting on the 22nd and we're meeting again on the 29th. So um, do we want to hold it open for public comments um, until Friday? And that allows us council Friday to what? May what? Friday, Friday at um, 5 the 11th. Or oh, this Friday? No. So no. you want to do it for Friday two? OK, fine. Yeah. And then we'll have yeah, the draft. Yeah, how about the 18th? Okay, open. Yeah. Right, Friday the 18th. And they'll have a draft for review then? Uh, or no. Show, a draft. After. Yeah, a draft after. Draft before. On the 29th. No, we want, we want the public to be able to see. Right, to comment on the. Incorporated drafts right. while the public so hearing is open. So maybe we have a draft out by like the 22nd so everyone can look at it yep. and then we meet well, the 29th. Let yep. me just clarify, a draft based upon what, comments received tonight and what, some of your comments? Well, right, or, yeah. we have to discuss because I don't think the comments. We'll discuss them next in. week. Right. In our work session. Yeah. yeah. But if you hold the well, period open until no, no, the 18th. No, 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 but then, okay. right, then we'd want to maybe hold it open until the 14th. Right? Am I right yeah. with the days? That was, no, yeah, you're wrong sorry, with the dates, that was my you're, you're point. So, um, no, if we hold it open till Monday, say at noon, then we can actually discuss at, on the 15th, right? Well, we're actually holding it Any open comments longer, that have come that's in, in so that we can circulate a new yes. draft. Okay, so we'll just, we will discuss on the 15th any comments that come in up until that point. Fine. Okay, but we'll still hold it open until Friday the 18th at noon. Yes. For okay, that's comments. fine. That's fine. Um, and then... Um, Get out a revised draft like the 22nd-ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah, my only word of caution is in all of us in mind, at some point you have to have a final draft that is enough for more comments I because know. it becomes an endless cycle then. And then it becomes precedent for every other law. Right. I mean, I, right. I think there's been a lot of attention and good comments received, so I don't want to discourage that, but there has got to be an end point where you have received all comments. Otherwise, you're commenting, revising, commenting, revising, commenting, yep. revising. So the 22nd, we have the final? Yeah. And it's out for a week? And that's two weeks? Is that two weeks? Yeah, that sounds good. That's fine. 22nd draft, and then we can discuss and vote on the 29th. Right. The fifteenth, we'll discuss the comments that were given tonight. Okay. And we don't we don't have to necessarily vote on the twenty ninth, but we can. We'll that's that's ample time mm -hmm. between now the fifteenth to comment and review, twenty second for draft and twenty ninth for final, or thereafter. So um. So we're gonna have uh, we're gonna mm -hmm. uh, close the hearing tonight. We're going to keep. Um, 
public it opened for public sorry. comments only reading through public, reading reading public comments. comments I'm sorry for Friday the 18th at noon council will mm -hmm. prepare the final draft for release um, close of business the 21st and that way it'll be out and about for an entire week before we meet again on the 29th when we'll have our vote but the that sounds good the problem is yes we're people are not going to be able to have comments after they see the final draft done. Well, there's two concerns. One is that if comments are received on the 18th and you want to draft on the 22nd, we can do that, but that draft would have the benefit only of Steve and our office's review of those comments mm -hmm. for your consideration. We wouldn't have benefit of your, you'll have to review those comments after we've incorporated what we believe reflects what the board has said and what is good practice. So if you're fine with that, then you could review that on the 29th and you'd have that further revised draft out for the public and you to review prior to the 29th. I mean, to Nick's point, every time we are looking to change the law, we have public meeting, public meeting, then we close it, leave it open for written comments. There's a final draft, and that's what we're voting on. We, it can't be that it never ends, that every draft right. gets and commented on. Well, I mean, this is something that's, I think, pretty critical and pretty important and affects a lot of people. So I'm not opposed to taking it a little slower, even though one might argue it's been slow as is. It's <laughs> been months. Right. Um, sorry, I'm a little tired. I'm a little slow mm -hmm. myself right now. Um, so I have no problem with the initial plan of, of yeah, I think it's a good plan. Okay. Other, what other you other just discussed. Them. Okay. It's it's more than what we would normally do anyway, so it's add it's an added benefit. Great. Okay. Okay. Great. So does somebody want to make that man. motion? So moved. Can we just say Very so good. moved. Second. You can. Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so want to our move to appoint agenda. Sid, Sid Falks into the ethics board for three year term effective May 8, 2018 through May 7, 2021. Right. I don't know. I think I don't know. just he moved just ahead. In, but but I just We're not even close to that, I think. Hold on. Am I in the wrong order? It's all right. So let's just get that one. Let's bang it out. Let me just finish the page. Let me see this page. Okay. So I want to get to. I want to get to Rob's kid. Appreciate the initiative. Where, where are we? Thank yes. you. Great. We get to what? Okay, so we're on number eighteen on yeah, the number 18. Uh, resolutions. All right. So he he made the motion. I'm going to second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to continue to nineteen. I I move to appoint Rick Stein to the Sustainability Advisory Board for a five-year term, effective May 8, 2018 through May 7, 2023. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 With honor, I'm going to take this next one. I move to appoint student members to uh, the Sustainability Advisory Board, Aaron Walk, Daniel Greenstein, Joseph O'Brien, and again to the Sustainability Advisory Board for a five-year term. Wow, really? Five-year term. Yeah, well, we have five-year term. Five-year term. Hey, 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 the, those We're not going go to go. college. Hmm? Yeah, he's going to come back from meetings. Yeah. Yeah. All right, just finish the resolution. No, no, we have you to out of You went out of order a little bit, caused some concern because the law hasn't been adopted yet that... Oh, Jeremy messed us up. God. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's go back to number one. But let me just ask you. Let me ask you a quick question. We're skipping since you brought Jeremy. Up. With that particular resolution, could <laughs> so I abstain from here. voting on my son, but approve the other student members? <laughs> yes, you would recuse yourself. I mean, recuse myself. And just my yes. son, though. Yes. Okay. And if I recuse myself because of my relationship with Rob Greenstein, does that mean <laughs> that? At some point, we're going to have a rule of necessity in which you need a majority to vote. Okay. I move to set a public <laughs> hearing regarding the town's annual report to New York State DEC regarding implementation of the MS4 stormwater to be held at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, May 29, 2018, in the town of Newcastle Assembly Room, located 200 South Greeley Avenue, Chappaqua. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to set a public hearing regarding a local law to amend Chapter 48, Article 3 of the Town Code concerning electrical inspections to be held at 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, May 29, 2018, in the Town of Newcastle Assembly Room, located at 200 South Greeley Avenue, Chappaqua. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to authorize a waiver of the noise ordinance section 90-5A to the Mount Kisco Country Club for an outdoor rock concert in the evening until 11.30 p.m. on May 25th. Did anybody notify residents? We, discussed that last we time. talked about that last time. Right. Um, I spoke to Alan Shapiro. Um, he said that he would notify his group, though he had not been notified about it, but he didn't have a problem with it, and he knew that it had, been, it had occurred in previous years. 
Fall this rock concert occurred in previous years? Yeah, this is not the first time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Second. This makes none invited. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I move to adopt the following resolution. Oh. Set forth herein. Um, resolved that the town board hereby approves the waiver of the fee for the record review and authorizes the execution of the stipulation of um, discon no, I know, I'm trying to read above of discontinuance and withdrawal of the appeal as set forth in the attached letter agreement. Do I have to say regarding the, these people? No, I mean, it's, no. Oh, it's it, the resolution's in the packet you're reading okay. from it. That's Perfect. Fine. Second. All okay. in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to adopt a local law amending Chapter 116 of the Town Code concerning the real property tax exemption for senior citizens. And be, yep, and once you get a second on your motion, I then have the change. Second. Good, and then we'd need a motion to amend the local law to reflect in Section 2 of a law, Chapter 116, Section 6. So there's language in there that has a mandatory notice that gets placed on the tax bill. So instead of putting the dollar amount, we're suggesting it read bracket assessor to insert New York State maximum eligible level income. So that way when he sends the notice out, he'll put the eligible level in that changes each year rather than having steady number. Perfect. So someone just needs to so amend moved. the local law as I move to amend the local law to include the maximum income threshold for eligibility. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We, ne we never did all in favor before you jumped in when Jeremy did his initial thing. Right, because that was... Because we haven't gotten right, there. Now you have to, because now you I have move to adopt a local law creating Chapter 100 of the Code of the Town of Newcastle to prohibit the sale of tobacco, liquid nicotine products, and electronic cigarettes to persons under age 21. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to adopt a local law to amend Chapter 63 of the Town Code of the Town of Newcastle concerning Energize New York Benefit Financing Program. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to adopt a local law amending Chapter 7 of the Town Code of the Town of Newcastle with respect to the Sustainability Advisory Board. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to approve a contract with DNR Laboratories uh, as in do not resuscitate 76 Westbury Park, Connecticut, 06795 for service and support of theater and uh, theater audio and video system at the Chapco Performing Art. Oh my God, I'm tired. Sorry, guys. Chapco Performing Art Center for a period. <laughs> He's cut off. 2017 to 18 for the annual cost of $5,000. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to approve the change order number three for ELQ Industries for Valmont decorative light pole and bracket in the amount of $30,949.72. And did we confirm that that will accommodate more than the appropriate number of lights? Yes. Okay, second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. I move to approve the contract with Westchester County for the first amendment to agreement number 15-958, removal of snow and ice from county roads in accordance with the letter dated February 13th of this grand year of 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to approve St. Mary's Church of the Virgin Banner request for the dates May 21st through June 2nd. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to accept the April monthly reports of the town clerk, court clerk, receiver of taxes, and building and engineering departments. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to adopt the minutes for the March 6, 2018 Town Board Work Session. Did we see those minutes? All in favor? Um, yeah, have a second I saw them. Okay, second. Do we have a second? I can second it. Second. Aye. Well, in favor. Oh, aye. aye. <laughs> I move to authorize the town engineer to attend a seminar called Effective Stormwater Infiltration on Friday, June 8, 2018. The cost for registration for this conference is $279. I just woke up. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes, I want a written report. Go ahead. I move to approve the payment of claims in the amount of $442,480. No, 442482 dollars 83 listed on the summary pre-check writing report and detail voucher detail report, each prepared on May 4th, 2018. Checks will be issued and mailed to each claimant listed on Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. All in favor, aye. 
Uh, I think I'm going to tape this resolution right now. This one. Okay, okay, you did sit already. Now we're going back to 20. All right, as I mentioned earlier in the, the um, God, meeting, I, I was moving to appoint student members Aaron Walk, Daniel Green, Greenstein, and Joseph <laughs> O'Brien to the Sustainability <laughs> Advisory Board for a five-year term? Why do we have a five-year term? How about a one-year term? Two years? It seems odd. What, yeah, what, what grade change. are these kids in? All different. They're all oh. different. Daniel's a sophomore, but certainly nobody is... Uh, in junior high school. Right. One year term? All right, so term. we'll change it to appoint the student member boards, members Aaron Walk, Daniel Greenstein, and Joseph O'Brien to the Sustainability Advisory Board for a one year term, effective May 8, 2018 through May 7th, 2019. Uh, 19. 2019, pardon me. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to recuse myself as far as Daniel's concerned. Aye. 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 Just, okay. Thank you. All right, I move to appoint Chris Roberta to the Environmental Review Board for a three-year term, effective May 8, 2018, through May 7, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to appoint Ted Holmes to the Environmental Review Board for a three-year term, effective May 8, 2018, through May 7, 2021. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to hire Tenshin Higashi as a seasonal office manager in the Recreation Department at a rate of $12 per hour, effective May 14th through August 3rd. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to hire Douglas Scott as Recreation Supervisor in the Recreation Department with an annual salary of $77,081.96, Group 9, Step 4, effective May 21st, 2018. This appointment will be contingent upon medical examinations and a probationary period of no more than 52 weeks. Well, in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to accept the proposal from Sand Signs and Awning, 925 Sawmill River Road, Yonkers, New York, for installation of an electronic V-form sign and associated copper roofing in the amount of $17,550 plus an additional $1,750 contingency for a total budget of $19,500. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I move to approve the following fee schedule for rental of the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center as set forth in the attached resolution. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now we're done. And now the air conditioner comes on. I think we're done. Anything else? I move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.